One of the things that I use the execute SQL task for quite frequently is to capture the value of an output parameter. Uh, many times you have singleton based stored procedures and by singleton I mean they return a single row guaranteed it's either zero or one there is either one row comes back or no rows come back and it's often faster to store those in output parameters than to send back a result set and have to process a full data set for .NET or SSIS. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. I'm sorry, lost the wrong thing. A common singleton style would be like a detail item. Let me pick something out here. You know, I'm just going to keep using this department table because it's easy. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. It's only got four columns. So what we want to do is create a stored procedure that returns a single department. And we have two choices. So choice A would be create proc get single department. And you query in for the department ID that you're asking for. And then it returns a result set. Okay, so this would be for a lot of inexperienced SQL Server developers, people just getting started with stored procedures, this would be an acceptable way to do it. We could do exactly what we asked. We could get single department and we could pass in 5 for example and it brings back department 5 we pass in 10 and it brings back department 10 nothing wrong with it however from a performance standpoint it's actually going to be faster to use what we call output parameters so let's go down here to choice B and an output parameter show you how this works. So we're going to create proc um, get department output params and pass in the department ID that you're looking for and that should have actually been a small int because when you match it to the data type over there you don't want to have to do data conversion. So I messed up on the original one, didn't do that one correctly. But you're going to use output parameters here. So now for each column that I want to return, I'm going to say name and I'm going to match the data type. So I see that's an invar car 50, so that's what I'm going to do. And I say the word out or output next to it. And so I do the same. I want to bring back group name and it's also invar car 50. And just to show you, you could have said out. Those have the exact same logical functions, just a shortcut. And the last column is modified date. And that is a date time. And I have to put in out. I usually just use out. And now when I define this, I assign the values of my variables equal to the column. So at group name equals group name, at modified date equals modified date, from human resources dot department, and then I put my where clause in here. Okay. So take a minute, and if you are kind of new to working with output parameters, kind of soak that in. Let me let me save this so we don't forget here. Execute SQL 05. Again, and I know I've said this many times throughout the course, uh, the file name may not be the same as what I just typed in, but it will be the same as the video file name. Okay, so to call this is quite different. I cannot just say exec that and pass the value 5 in. Uh, I get an error message. Um, did I not create it? Sorry. I get an error message that says it expects the name parameter. Okay, so we defined name as a mandatory parameter. I don't have a default value, so therefore it's a required parameter. And so I actually have to put the name in here. 
So it's a better practice for me to do something like this, at department ID equal 5, comma, at name equal, well now wait a minute, this is an output parameter. I don't want to assign a value to the output parameter because it's getting assigned inside the stored procedure, right? So you gotta, you got to do a little bit of work. We'll declare name, match it to the output data type. Declare group name, match it to the output data type. Yes, I could have done this all on one line. Declare modified date, match it. Okay. Now, at name equals, at name out. And the second parameter, third parameter is group name. So group name equals group name out. And final parameter modified date is equal to modified date out. Now this is, for somebody who's not a SQL junkie, oh, I can't say four letter words, it's really crazy syntax, okay? <laughs> because in the usual world we're used to using the equality symbol as an assignment operator moving from right to left, meaning that the value on the right side gets assigned to what's on the left side. However, it's the opposite when you use this keyword out. When you say the word out, you say that the value of the left side will go out and be stored into the right side. So another way to think of this um, is that this is the stored procedures variable or parameter name and this is the local variable you want to store the value of the SP parameter in. They may have the same name, it's coincidence, I could have named my local variables, the one that I declared, I could have named them anything I want. The key point is that they match the data types that the output expects. So now I can execute this, I have to include my local variable declarations, and it works great. However, if I want to see the values of those, I need to wrap them into a select statement and at modified date. And you can see that it actually does store those in scalar columns. Okay, so this, in my opinion, and in most SQL developers, is a better choice. This is a singleton pattern. We are querying on the primary key of the human resources dot department table. So this, every time you call this stored procedure, it's guaranteed to return zero or one rows. Never is going to return two. So anytime you're in that situation you should use output parameters. Now, I hope, I hope that was helpful. Let's talk about calling output parameters inside of an execute SQL task. So let's go to Visual Studio, let's crack open a new project, and Let's see what I'll do here. I'm going to call it, I'm going to make variables, local variables, local to the package. So we'll make a variable called um, department ID, and we'll make it an int 16. Set it to, and there's that bug again, set it to 4. Um, we'll make a name variable, leave it as a string with an empty string, a group name, as a string with an empty string and a modified date will be a date time. Okay, cool. So now you got, just to make sure you got it, I'll just show you these here. They're, they're package scoped so I don't have to worry about not being able to access them later on. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make this guy here the input parameter to the stored procedure and these three baddies right here are going to be our output parameters. So let's do it. So let's grab our execute SQL. Really not tough to do. I'm going to do this using an OLEDB. 
uh, and it follows the same rules that our usual OLEDB parameterization does. So that was AdventureWorks 2008, I believe. And I'm just going to do a direct input here. What I'm not going to do is declare my local variables. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to exec whatever my sword procedure's name was, this guy. And then I'm going to say at department ID equal question mark. That's not new, is it? We did that a couple of videos ago, right? We're going to map this one up to uh, our parameter mapping as number zero because it's the first parameter marker. And then for my next stored procedure, that one is name equal question mark out. Well, that's new. And a group name equal question mark out and modified date equal question mark out. So let's just talk about, let me, let me see, let me zoom in one more time here. I know that's probably big, but <laughs> a lot of people watch these on the little handheld devices, so I try to make it easy for everybody to be able to see. Uh, so much like we did the last time, the ones that are prefixed here with at, sorry, these are the parameter names of the stored procedure. We cannot change those. They are set. Whoever created the stored procedure defined what those were. Over here, oh man, oh, that's way too big. <laughs> now we're defining this is parameter zero, this is one, this is going to be two. So, sorry about that. I accidentally hit mute on the microphone and I didn't know it. And I recorded like this awesome video. It was so great. And you don't get to see it now because it has no audio. So, sorry. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I'm not kidding. I really did actually hit mute. But I'll, I'll redo it so that everybody can take part here. Where we last left off before my technical difficulties, we were taking a look here at the four parameters. So I need to map these up in the parameter mapping over here, right? So let's do it. Um, department ID is 0, name is 1, group name is 2, modified date is 3. So I need four parameters, so I hit the button four times. You can come back and change them. Uh, department ID is an input parameter and it is 0. Department name, though, or name, is actually an output parameter. So you see you have the different types. We're going to take a look at the return value in the next video. So output, and it's not a type long. This is actually a string, so it's an NVAR car. And then we've got group name, also an out, also an NVAR car, and you can just type them in, that's fine. And then I could type this in as well, user modified date. Uh, it's an output, and it's a, uh-oh, we know it's three, but there's a couple of different date ones. There's date, there's, oh, sorry, D, let's get them to where we can see them. There's date, there's DB date, there's DB time, DB time, oh gosh, there's so many. Well, for this one, the DB timestamp maps to the SQL Server date time in theory. So that's the one that I actually want to look and use. I say in theory, because <laughs> you will see some oddities with that. Just give me a second. So I say DB timestamp, and I'm not alone in picking that. I don't make these up. Uh, if you click the help button down here, and you remember our little link that we had about working with the parameters. So you click that. There's a little section in here called uh, how to use parameters with date and time data types. And it will tell you the differences between ADO.net, um, OLEDB, and it shows you, hey, look, if you're dealing with a date time data type over here in a SQL Server, then you want that to become, hey, look at there, DB timestamp. Okay, got it. Cool. 
So we say OK. And we're good to go, right? Well, one other thing I would like to do is my script task so that we can do a little pop-up. You know, we really wouldn't do this in the real world, but really helpful for development. So go pick all my user level variables. And I'm just going to pop them up. Oh, I should have done VB. Um, not that it matters. Uh, so system.forms, system.windows.forms.messagebox.show, uh, dts.variables collection, name, dot val, dot two string, um, to group name and modified date. So this isn't anything fancy. It's the same message, message box that we've used throughout the course. The only difference in VB is that these would have been parentheses, right? That's the only difference. And there wouldn't be any semicolons. OK, ready? Awesome, it worked. Oh no, it fails. Got a problem. And it's because of this goofy little modified date thing. It says the value being assigned, look at the very first line, the value being assigned to the variable user modified date differs from the current variable type. So let's just have a reminder. The SSIS variable type was date time. The SQL server data type was date time and our OLEDB SSIS type was DB timestamp which we read the docs and that maps up to that. Okay, you do need to read that page. You're going to get stuck and when you're working with this, when you are trying to output a parameter from a SQL Server stored procedure that stores a date, here's what you got to do, man. You got to go and make this guy a string. Just dump a string in there. Okay, so you make your SSIS uh, variable type a string. And then you'd leave this part alone. You don't change your parameter mapping. This is really important. You don't bring back a string here. Um, I'll show you what would happen if you do. I can bring back an invar car, for example, a string, and I can execute this. And it's going to work just great. Marketing is the name of the department. Sales and marketing is the group. And there is the value if you go ahead and tell the parameter mapping that it's a string. And if you know your SQL, that's the same thing as saying cast uh, modified date as NVAR car with no length, right? Or uh, convert NVAR car modified date. And so it's using the standardized format for my particular installed language. That's not probably what you want. What you want to do, take note, if I go back to my execute SQL task and I tell the parameter, no, 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 that's not just a string, man. That's up here. That's going to be that DB date time. Uh, so let me get it, find it, DB timestamp, sorry. And when I do that, it's going to look a little bit more like what you expect. We've got our milliseconds, and it's also put in the microseconds. It's now seven digits here. This is more what you want. And you can play around with these data types uh, for your parameter mapping. You can go over here and say, you know, it's going to return DB time to, and I, I don't, you know, that's not really going to do too much. Oh, that, DB time to, it didn't bring back anything except for the time. I, I thought I was doing something different there. Uh, but you can play around with these and see how it affects what you bring back. You see, that's what's so awesome about putting one of these little message boxes in development. You can see exactly what's happening. You can very quickly and very easily test. So I hope you have a good idea now of how to use these output parameters with your SQL stored procedures.